The next person we're going to hear from is Dr. Fersland here. I haven't seen you, so. Are you here? Come on up. <laughs> Anthea Fersland uh, received an award yesterday. It's very nice. Okay, um, I did a workshop on severe and enduring anorexia nervosa, and I want to be mindful that this is, this is a difficult topic for you guys. It may be a real nightmare, potentially, that your loved one would develop a severe and enduring eating disorder, and I'm also sensitive to the possibility that some of you do have loved ones who have had a long course of the disorder. Um, I came into, I've been working nearly four decades, and I've been involved more with the severe enduring end because I'm an older person, and so uh, when an older person comes into the clinic, uh, they would be assigned to me because um, it seemed to make more sense. I had more experience, and I was more like a nearer their age than some of my 23-year-old um, psychology colleagues. Um, okay, uh, the workshop I did with Professor Towers and two women who had a long-standing eating disorder, some of you may know of them, June Alexander and Shannon Calvert, who was mentioned by Rebecca. Uh, I think they're testament to the fact that recovery is possible. Um, I just want to read out a couple of bullet points from my first slide yesterday because it might put, this is on my bar bill from last night. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> why uh, am I interested, passionate and committed um, about severe and enduring? Okay. Because anorexia nervosa is a debilitating illness, robbing people of a full life and affecting their families. Second bullet point. Because severe and enduring anorexia nervosa means that people with anorexia nervosa were not diagnosed or treated early enough to prevent their disorder from becoming severe and enduring, and this is unacceptable. So that's my position. Um, I think we need to do early intervention, no question. Good early intervention, right? But we need to get primary care physicians and school nurses to recognize the disorder before it becomes a disorder. So any question of disordered eating, any distortions, any abnormal behaviors, we need to treat and prevent them from developing. Just one more piece of research that came out of my clinic um, late last year, and this is a message of hope. And that is, we divided all our results, because my clinic's quite well known in Western Australia, and we, do, we have a research arm, and we divided our outcomes results into people with a more than three-year history, more than seven-year history, and more than 10-year, 11-year history. Because there is a debate in the field about how to define severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. And the good news is, however long people have had the disorder, their chances of staying in treatment and recovering or doing well were exactly the same. So this is something we must not give up on people just because they've had it five years, seven years, 10 years, another piece of research. And again, you can look at this as depressing or positive. I look at it hopeful. And that is research from Boston, uh, Massachusetts Hospital, Cameron Eddy's research, which, which shows that after 10 years, only a third of people with anorexia nervosa have fully recovered. You think that's, that's pretty bad. And it is. And it's unacceptable. The rate for bulimia nervosa recovery is about 60 plus percent. The interesting thing is when they looked at those same people 10 years later, the, people, the recovery rates for bulimia stayed the same around 60, which again is, that's bad enough. But the good news is that people with anorexia nervosa the recovery rates after 22 years was over 60%. So people can, and this is me as a clinician, people can continue recovering 
whatever stage they're at, however bad the disorder is. Thank you. Yeah. So if you have a question, wait till we get to you to ask it. Who has a question? Hold the mic, Laura. Hi. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to hold the Okay. Um, it was really hopeful to hear that. Uh, my daughter um, was eight when she was first diagnosed. Um, we've been battling it now for five years. Um, so, you know, when I heard you say over 11 years, um, it could be that way. She has um, opposition, oppositional defiant disorder with OCD and anorexia. And so we just are, are in a, at the moment, we're sinking. So I'm just going to be as hopeful as possible. Good. And you need to find clinicians that are hopeful. That's also key. Because some clinicians are not hopeful. And they kind of pat you on the back and say, I know you're having a hard time. And that's all we can do. Don't take that. Hello. Um, this is not necessarily directed just at what you're talking about, Anthea, but um, throughout the conference and through most conferences, we hear a lot about severe and enduring anorexia. We never hear about severe and enduring bulimia or severe and enduring BED. Does anybody know of anything being done to look at these populations or a way to shift to looking at these populations or other thoughts? Um, no, you're right. Um, I think the research is mainly on a severe and enduring anorexia nervosa because of the debilitating f physical um, signs of the illness. Um, there obviously should be more research. Research is so underfunded. Mental health research generally and eating disorders research specifically is so much less funded than medical research on other things like cancer, which, I mean, I'm a cancer survivor, so I like the fact there's lots of research on cancer, but it should not override the need for mental health money, and it is money. It's money, so advocacy for um, mental health research is important. Yeah, you talked about the need for intervening before it even got got anywhere. And then you started at year three. What about year one and? Okay, um, th th our study was looking at whether having a long-term illness. So why we chose three is because Daniel, uh, Jim Locke, uh, particularly his data, suggests that if you've had the eating disorder more than three years, don't bother. Not quite, but almost. So we looked at that three-year marker to see if that was true. So um, basically, th there was a, like, it didn't matter how long um, that you'd had the disorder. The chances of recovery um, are low, too low, but they are not worse. We think of it as worse because the disorder gets worse, the distress for you, the carers gets worse. And we know from Laura and other people's research that the brain does get worse the longer it is starved and uh, involved. So it's not, I'm, I'm not saying it's easy, but it is possible and it happens. And my workshop yesterday with two women who had had an eating disorder, each of them for over 30 years, is testament. And we have to be, I don't know, I don't like the word patient. I don't think we should be patient. I think we should be pushing. But yes, we have to be patient as, as carers, as clinicians, because, um, we, but we need to be pushing for more, more everything, better treatment, more research, um, and earlier identification. All right, last, last question. Um, I just wanted to know, with severe and enduring, also putting together what you're saying with Dr. Hill, is there something that you're finding that is helpful with severe and enduring that is particular, you know, that, I don't know what the word is, but I'm just finding that we're just spending a lot of time after a lot of years. It just seems to be the same old thing. So maybe there's something besides, you know, deep brain stimulation, but is there something that's helping the rewiring that's making the difference? 
uh, it's probably Laurie should be asking that question, not me. Um, well, okay. Um, I think we have to adapt our psychotherapy. Um, and one of, one of the things that was talked about in my workshop yesterday was deep brain stimulation and new medications. I mean, there is research going on um, for those people who have had the disorder a long time, anorexia nervosa at least. Um, some of it's helpful, but then some psychotherapy is helpful. So it's really hard to know um, what, what, uh, what to do, because there is, there, there certainly are people who specialize in alternative treatments, and that's where the field is going. I guess my message is that you, do, you shouldn't rule out traditional uh, good psychotherapy f because someone's had a disorder a long time. Thank you.